Good morning and welcome. I'm Natalie Shirley, President of OSU OKC and Vice Chair of the Convention and Visitors Bureau for the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber. The Greater Oklahoma City Chamber organizes these Friday forums for members who want to learn more about current issues in our region. In Oklahoma City, as many of you know, tourism is the third largest industry, generating $2.9 billion in domestic travel expenditures and employing more than 35,000 people in the Oklahoma City metro. Oklahoma City's appeal as a meeting destination plays an important role in drawing visitors from across the globe, and the future of that industry hinges on the development of the MAPS-3 Convention Center. But before we discuss that further, I'd like to take a moment to recognize today's series signature event sponsor, Cox Business. Would Randy Chandler, Vice President of Cox Business, come to the podium, please? Well, it's a real pleasure to be here today with you all. Uh, Cox Business is really pleased to once again be the presenting sponsor for the Friday Forum. At Cox, we align ourselves with the work of the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber to continually enhance our image as a great place to live and to do business. Tourists and visitors contribute significantly, as we've just heard, in direct spending at our restaurants, hotels, museums, and retailers. Tourism creates jobs that benefits our businesses and our local residents. We are excited to hear from our panel of experts about Oklahoma City's new convention center and how it will help to promote the city as a first-class tourist destination. Whether drawing national and regional groups to our new convention center or helping increase the number of high-quality jobs, the Chamber is driving more positive momentum here in Oklahoma. Cox partners with the Chamber in this effort by continually investing more in our infrastructure in order to meet the needs of existing businesses and customers and prospective ones. Cox Business thanks you for your attendance today, and we hope to, to listen with you about the exciting things that will be coming to Oklahoma City. Thank you so much, Randy. Before we continue, let's recognize our other sponsors. Our host sponsor is the Beacon Club. Our series corporate sponsor is Guernsey. Thank you all. At this time, please enjoy lunch, and we'll introduce our speakers shortly. At this time, I'd like to introduce our first speaker for today. Stephen Hacker is the principal of Bravo Management Group, an organization that provides strategic leadership, governance, marketing, and event planning expertise to associations and trade show, show organizers across the, across the world. He authors a column entitled The Association Doctor in the Association News Magazine, published monthly by Schneider um, and read by 50,000 association pro professionals. Stephen is recognized as an authority on the structure and leadership of nonprofit organizations and has earned prestigious professional designations, including Certified Association Executive in 2012. He is the first American to have received the Power and Profile Award of the Joint Meetings Industry Council. During more than two decades as CEO of the International Association of, Ex of Exhibitions and Events headquartered in Dallas, Texas, Stephen helped build IAEE membership fourfold and established offices in Brussels, Singapore, and Beijing. He designed the Certified in Exhibition Management designation program that now operates in 10 nations. Please help me in welcoming Stephen Hacker. Thank you. Good, good morning. I always enjoy listening to my own eulogy. I've got to tell you that I'm a little nervous. This, this is more Oklahomans than I've been around in any place other than the Cotton Bowl. And I'm usually sitting on the other side of the field. So um, let me 
first clarify a couple of issues. I am not here to be a cheerleader for building convention centers. That would be foolish. Uh, I am here uh, to try to help you understand when it makes sense for a city to renovate, expand, or build a new center. It is not an issue without controversy because of its scope and size. But if it's done right, it can be a breathtaking driver of economic development. And I'm going to share with you some examples in a moment. But first, let's talk a little bit about the industry. Can you advance the slides from back there? Why don't we do it that way? First of all, meetings are an enormous source of business, even though the fact of the matter is the meetings industry, and I'm, go I'm going to include in the term meetings, conventions, conferences, seminars, trade shows, consumer shows. Just for sake of convenience, I'll refer to that as the meetings industry. But the meetings industry results, if you invest a dollar in business travel, that will equate to nine and a half dollars of new revenue. If you invest that same dollar in business travel, it will create two dollars and ninety cents of new profit. These numbers have been calculated based on actual corporate travel experience major corporations. And most executives of corporations understand that the face-to-face -face experience, conventions and, and trade shows and such, help them develop the kind of relationships and partnerships that they need to be successful organizations. Next slide, please. How many meetings are there? We don't really know exactly because there's so damn many of them. It's hard to get an accurate number. But it, they say it's 1.83 million meetings a year. Okay. Even if it's off by a margin of 20% or 30%, that's a lot of meetings, a lot of meetings. Uh, I can tell you for a fact that there are 10,900 exhibitions because my former organization measures the census of those events every three years and we track, tracked the uh, increase in revenue, contraction in revenue, growth, decrease, etc. cetera. Um, I have to believe that there are 1.3 million corporate meetings. Corporate meetings, you know about corporate meetings better than anybody else. So many of you are involved in organizing or attending them. 67,000, almost 70,000 incentive meetings. That's a hugely growing sector of the business travel sector. Every three years, an organization, a federation of the meetings industry called the Convention Industry Council, computes with PricewaterhouseCoopers the economic impact of the industry. And without boring you with the specific details, uh, I'll just pick a couple. Uh, the economic impact that meeting attendees, those of us who go to somebody's meeting, generates is now about $225 billion, which represents a 10% increase over the last time they measured it in 2009. Now, that's pretty important when you think about a 10% increase at a time when we were trying to recover from the most devastating recession the country had ever experienced. And you know one of the first things that always gets cut is business travel. And so it's been a long, hard climb back up from 2009, but 10% increase in that against those headwinds is pretty substantial. Uh, you can see the rest of those numbers. They're big numbers, and they're all positive growth numbers in the same last three-year period. I can tell you anecdotally, based on what I've seen in the last two years, that the next time they do this computation in 2016, unless there is some new economic intrusion, a new recession, these numbers are going to be even more staggering. 
because there's a lot of meeting activity taking place. You know that anecdotally from your own experience as well. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. I'm going to give you a short course in Site Selection 101. How do event planners make decisions about where to take the events that they are organizing? Do you advance one? Dates. Second, space. Finally, rate. It's all about dates, space, and rate. What do I mean? If I'm charged with planning a new event, first thing that I have to figure out is, does the destination where I'm thinking of taking the event have the dates available when I want to do the event? Some events are very restricted in the dates that they can meet by their tradition, by their market, by their preference. And so if the dates that I have to meet are not available in a particular city, there's no further discussion. I'll move on. If the date is available, the next issue that comes into play is, do you have the space that I want to use? Most event planners know what kind of space they want to use. If the space is not available, that's the end of the discussion. And finally is the issue of rate. How much are you going to charge me to access this space on the dates that I want to use the event, uh, the, use the facility? The, that's it. It's, it doesn't get any more complex than that. Now we'll go to Site Selection 102. There are other characteristics that come into play in the decision-making process. Let's say the date, space, and rates are acceptable. The next issue that I'm going to consider is the convenience and the cost of traveling to that destination. Not for me, but for those who I want to attend the event. The next issue that comes up is ambiance. W what are the circumstances? What is the environment? like in that destination, at that destination? Is it suitable? Is it a good match for the characteristics of my audience? And finally, what's it going to cost us to produce the event in that place? So what, what do I mean by what is it going to cost us? If I wanted to do an event of 10,000 people, and I'm considering New York City or Waco, Texas, there's going to be a considerable cost difference in producing those two, the same event in those two venues. If I go to New York, I'm going to have to deal with union labor. I'm not going to have to deal with that in Waco. Now, that's an extreme example. Ambiance. I'm almost reluctant. Do we have media in the room? Yes, uh, that's good enough. So I'm not going to give any specific examples. But you can think of a city where you just would not want to go. <laughs> There's lots of them. And then on the other hand, you can think of a smaller number of cities where you'd really get excited to take advantage of the opportunity to extend a day or two or three. I'm thinking San Francisco, San Diego, Miami Beach. You get the picture. That's ambiance. And then cost and convenience of travel. There are some destinations in the last 10 years that are perfectly fine destinations, but they've lost airlift. Airlift is a term we use to, to compute the total number of airplane seats into that destination and out of that destination. And as travelers, especially business travelers, we have become pretty spoiled. Um, if it takes three connecting flights to get to that destination, you're probably going to lose 40% of your attendance. People want a nonstop. They want it at a pretty decent price. That's it. It's that simple. It's human nature. Let's go to the next slide. Let's talk about Oklahoma City. You've got a remarkably valuable asset in Will Rogers Airport. Why? Why do I say that? Let's go to the bullet points. It's a small hub. It's morphing into a medium hub. Next point, 3.8 million passengers a year. That's manageable. 60.4 million passengers a year go through that god-awful DFW airport. 
Next bullet point. Six carriers, including one low-cost carrier. Next. You've got an FAA and the AAR aircraft services facilities. Those are huge assets that make the airport even more valuable. Next. Terminal expansion is being discussed. And then finally, Lariat Landing. This is kind of a clone of the uh, Alliance Airport northwest of Fort Worth, which in terms of commercial value is one of the most com valuable assets of any of the airports in the world because of its logistics handling, freight handling and distribution. So this is a very important asset. How about the location of the city? If you tried to design the most convenient destination in terms of location in the United States, you could not do a better job than Oklahoma City. If you draw a 500-mile radius around here, 71 million people reside within 500 miles. And next bullet point, next bullet point, how much better does it get? Next slide. Ambiance, you know, you've got it all. Bricktown, Mike took me to the uh, rowing facility. You've got, despite this morning's weather, you've got marvelous weather. <laughs> 300 days of sun, three, 299 and a half days of sunshine. Uh, terrific restaurants. You've got the reasons why people want to come here. Terrific hotels. Next, the competitive set. This is a term that's used to, to designate who is it that is our prime competition. Well, you've got to be realistic about who you're competing against, but when you look at a regional map, these are the culprits. Some are easier to compete against than others, and in some cases, you don't even want to compete for some of their business because it's not a good fit here. It's too big, whatever it might be. Next slide. This is what happened in Houston and Dallas. Dallas struggled for 20 years uh, with a nice convention center in downtown, and nobody wanted to go there. It wasn't close to any hotels. After 21 years of battle, including battling, God bless him, Dr. Hayward Sanders in San Antonio, Dr. No, they put in the Omni Hotel two years ago, and it's magic. They've tripled the number of citywide events in Dallas in the last three years. Triple. Houston, same experience. Next slide. Room nights. How many rooms are occupied in those cities? The same profile for the same reason. Next slide. This week we learned that Massachusetts has allocated a billion dollars. Miami is going to allocate a half a billion. Los Angeles is going to spend about the same to expand their facilities. And last night I heard uh, Sydney, Australia is spending $4 billion to build a new convention center, hotels, and recreation facilities right on Darling Harbor. Next. Conclusions. If you build it, they may not come. But if you build it in a place where they already want to come, that's magic. All of the elements of an expansion new development program must orbit around the customer. It's got to be a customer focus. And then focus on the key markets that you know you can serve adequately. So that, in a nutshell, is it. And I'll be happy to stay as long afterwards and, and chat with anybody who has further questions. Thank you for your attention and hospitality. Thank you, Stephen. All right, let's now welcome our other panelists um, to the stage. So if all of y'all will head towards the stage. Um, joining us today is Carrie Watkins. She's the Executive Director of Oklahoma City National Memorial and Museum. Carrie Watkins is a third generation journalist and became Oklahoma City National Memorial's first staff member. Okay. All right. First staff member as a communications director in March of 1996. She assumed the executive director responsibilities in 1999. Carrie oversaw the design competition, coordinated the international, national, and local media. 
She also worked with her board and staff in raising the $29 million for the construction and completion of the Memorial Museum Archives and today oversees all operations of the Outdoor Symbolic Memorial and Museum, one of Oklahoma City's most visited sites. Our next speaker is Mike Carrier. Mike has been active in the travel and tourism industry for more than 30 years, working in meeting planning, hotel sales, and facilities management, and has served as president of the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Okay, there, I guess there are certain letters I can't say. In Greenville, <laughs> in Columbia, South Carolina, and Knoxville, Tennessee. Mike joined the Oklahoma City Convention and Visitors Bureau in July of 2007 as its president. Prior to his move to Oklahoma City, he served as the general manager of the Shreveport Convention Center. Ava Scaramucci, owner of Nona's Euro American Restaurante and Bar, is a native Oklahoman born in Altus. She attended the University of Oklahoma, and she's the proud owner of the Painted Door Gift Boutiques, Nona's Bakery and Nona's Euro American Restaurante and Bar. She and her husband also own and operate Cedar Springs Farm, a greenhouse operation that grows fresh produce exclusively for Nona's. Please welcome Avis to the stage. And our final speaker is Sheila Morago, Executive Director, Oklahoma Indian Gaming Association. The Oklahoma Indian Gaming Association is responsible for bringing over 3,000 individuals to Oklahoma City each year through the National Indian Gaming Association Training Conference. She is a member of the Gila River Gaming uh, Indian Community in Arizona. Prior to working for OIGA, Sheila was the executive director for the Arizona Indian Gaming Association from 2004 to 2011. While in Arizona, she was credited for fostering an environment of mutual respect among all of the tribes, the state and federal government, which allowed Arizona to maintain its national visibility as the model for Indian gaming. She was the director of public relations for the National Indian Gaming Association based in Washington, D.C. So with that, we'll start the questions and we'll work this as such. I will ask a, a very general question which will allow the panelists to jump off into, into the issues I know that all of you have, have come to, to hear about. And then after we're finished, we'll take questions from the audience and you all can, can uh, delve deeper into to what you're, you're interested in. So Carrie, let's start with you. You represent the Oklahoma City National Memorial, which attracts visitors from outside the Oklahoma City community. From your perspective, what role does tourism play in the success of your organization, and how would the convention center impact that? Well, 80% of our visitors come from outside of Oklahoma City. So um, it, tourism is critical to our business, as is the convention center. When there's a convention or an event in town, our business increases about 64, 65%. So, we can quantify those numbers. We know it's important. When there's additional people in town spending the money, they, they want something to do. We adjust hours accordingly, host events for those folks. And so we've made a business out of making sure we can accommodate groups and conventions in town. It's very important for us. And I think it will prove more and more important for us as the further we get away from April 19, 1995. Thank you. Avis, you've been in the restaurant and retail industry in Oklahoma City for almost two decades. And the Painted Door and Nona's has been located in Bricktown since 2005. How important is the convention center to retail and restaurant establishments in Oklahoma City? Um, in 1991, I opened Painted Door uh, on Southwestern. And um, by 1995, I had opened also Nona's in that same location. And truly, by 2000, I was uh, finally a bit comfortable with what I was doing. And you may wonder why. Well, the why is because I never do anything that I have previous history with. So I had never been in uh, retail, nor had I been in the restaurant industry. So you would have to probably ask, so between 2000 and 2005, what happened? Why would you move? Uh, why would you pick up everything you have built and move to a totally different location? And the answer is really uh, fairly simple. 
I could not help but notice certainly that there was a, an, an excitement and a rebuilding uh, of a heart of a grand old city, and that would be our own city, Oklahoma City. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't help but notice, maybe I'm not supposed to say certain words. <laughs> uh, I couldn't help but notice also that um, there was lots of sporting events that I, I had no opportunity to really capture any of that business. There was uh, lots of um, concerts. I really didn't have um, opportunity to be involved in that either or the equestrian business at the um, State Fair Park. But the thing I noticed most, uh, uh, as Steve called it, was meetings. All of these meetings, all of these convention people coming to town, uh, and they came to stay. It was not just one night. It was for an extended period of time. And I just felt like that was really important if I were to make my business grow. So that's how, in 2005, I ended up um, in downtown, in the very heart, which would be Bricktown. And as they say, the rest is, is really history because what happens is the difference between a person that attends a convention and a person that attends a concert. You know, that convention goer comes here, excited to be here, but they plan on staying a bit. They plan on spending money, they plan on enjoying, and they plan on taking in the amenities of wherever they are. So that allows for businesses like me um, to not only develop the relationship, but quite frankly, in the gift store, for example, 90% of my business is based on the traveler, the convention goer. And you may say, well, why? 50% uh, in Nona's is, is, is dependent upon that uh, traveler, that convention person. The difference is once we establish relationships with these people, and believe it or not, they come back time and time again for various reasons, especially if they love to come here, and they do. Um, in gifts, I get to continue that relationship. I ship things. I'm a shipper for throughout the United States on a regular basis. Um, and that just allows for a growth that there is no other way to acquire that. Um, it's a dollar that is a gift to us. It's something that they take nothing but our hospitality. They love coming to Oklahoma City. There is no city anywhere that has the greater amenity than we, which is our people. But they leave behind their dollars and they leave behind their goodwill. So for me, it's just become uh, a hugely important part of our business and something that even if you showed up one day and had no idea of the ebb and flow of these people, you would notice because they're everywhere. And most of them are pretty nice. <laughs> <laughs> most of them are so happy and so surprised. Um, the few old grouches, we just know that um, they probably wouldn't be happy anywhere. And uh, I try to match them up with only the two grouches that are in Oklahoma City, so it works out well. <laughs> um, anyway, it is hugely important to me, and I think this new convention center, what it really offers is a chance for us to grow and expand and uh, uh, have new possibilities for everyone. Thank you. Carrie, do you see a similar excitement um, about folks coming to Oklahoma City? I really do. I mean, we tell our staff and our volunteers, sometimes they may be the only Oklahoman some visitors get to meet. And so we kind of work off that, but we really believe that people love it when they come here. They're sometimes surprised by what they see here, but they always love their experience. They love the brick town. They love the events around. And, and I think they are pleased by uh, people who have come back at what they've seen in changes of the city. And so I, I would agree that the convention center for us is the kind of the icing on the cake. I mean, it brings in people that we wouldn't get otherwise. They are looking for something to do. We provide that. And um, they leave with the taste of Oklahoma that you, you couldn't pay for. I mean, you just can't pay for what, how the people treat them 
and they talk about it time and time again. I love to be on the elevator as people are leaving and, and hear their responses. That's great. Sheila, when you coordinate events for organizations in your role at the Oklahoma Indian Gaming Association, how important is the facility to your decision on where to actually locate the meeting? What is Oklahoma City's current convention center lacking from your perspective? Well, if you can imagine, we bring in about 3,000 people in the middle of August, so they, I mean, <laughs> they, they really want to come here if they were coming here in the middle of August. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Oklahoma is the third largest revenue generator in gaming in the United States. So this market, especially for the people who are in the sales departments of, of companies that do business with us, are very interested in making sure that they're here. We currently take up poor Mike's Convention Center, um, the whole thing. Um, we can't, and we can't grow anymore. The market is continuing to grow. We clocked, um, Oklahoma was the only um, jurisdiction that clocked a 7% increase in revenue in one year. So we're continually, to, we're continually growing and we're continuing to get more companies interested in coming in. The problem is, is I can't grow, grow any bigger. We are sold out, that floor gets sold out, 61% of it gets sold out the year before. It, the year before. We are two months out and I have 10, 10 by 10s left. Um, so, and we bring in a ton of people who, by the way, love to go to Nona's and uh, <laughs> in Bricktown because they're all salespeople and they take their clients out. So on a, mon on a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday in Oklahoma City, you will notice every restaurant's gonna be booked. There's a lot of people going out to the clubs and you know, some of the clubs actually open up that week when they're, not, when they're normally closed. So, you know, for us, a new convention center would mean more revenue for the association, more folks coming into town, and more folks spreading around their money. <laughs> and essentially, from what I'm hearing you say, a new convention center will mean you'll be able to stay here. You'll be, you will be able to continue to come to Oklahoma City well, and grow your business. Exactly. But we're in Oklahoma. We can't go anywhere else. I, it's not like I can take the Oklahoma Indian Gaming Association trade show and take it to Dallas. So it's just simply going to be a stifling of it. Right. Of it. It, you know, right now, especially with the, the amount of um, equipment that comes in for this particular show, it is a lot of electronics, a lot of um, really nice displays. But they're used to Las Vegas, they're used to San Diego, they're used to high ceilings, they're used to a, a lot of technology in a convention center, and um, you know, they have to scale down here. They can't use their really snazzy booth spaces, their, their signage, and because the ceiling's too low. Um, we lay m hundreds upon hundreds of miles of, of, of cable for this, so we literally take up the, we, just set up alone takes us one week. Very good. So Stephen, how does Oklahoma City stack up against cities of a similar size when it comes to attracting conventions? When we build a new facility, how can we expect it to impact Oklahoma City's businesses and its tourism industry? Well, I think it might be constructive to kind of connect to Sheila's last comment here. One of the things you may not know about the current convention center is it's dated, it's ceilings are lower than they should be, but for the planner and for the exhibitor, the internal layout, the loading docks, and the limitations to moving freight quickly and efficiently results in much higher cost than would otherwise be the case. That's a technical issue but you're dealing with technical customers when you're dealing with event planners. Um, I'm sure that you've had lots of complaints about how long it takes to get the freight from the truck to the floor because of the inadequacies of a 1970s era design building. So coming back to the main question, when I think about other cities in your competitive set, um, let's take out Dallas, let's take out Houston. They're too big, they're different markets. Yeah, you might be able to compete for some events, but the heart of your competition is likelier to be Fort Worth, uh, likelier to be Austin. Let's take Austin as a good example. Austin's got a beautiful convention center smack in the middle of town. 
surrounded by great facilities, Sixth Street, all of this stuff. There's only one small problem. The city count, and Austin is my home, so I can say this. Traditionally, the city council of Austin for the last 40 years has been a, a, a group of hippies and fools. <laughs> who have consistently opposed the expansion of any sort of infrastructure. And at the same time, the city's grown by 120% in the last 30 years. So the result now is, on any given day, at any given time in downtown Austin, Texas, and surrounding it by 30 miles, you have gridlock. It will take you an hour to go from anywhere in Austin to anywhere else in Austin, unless you're walking, and you can make it in a lot less time. <laughs> That's, a, that's an issue. That's an issue for the events industry. Uh, you've got a facility, when it goes in here, that has been designed with easy access on the roads. You don't have that kind of traffic issue, which is a very serious obstacle to overcome. All of the other attributes of Austin aside, you've got some of the same issues in Fort Worth. Their convention center is dated. Um, it's smack in the middle of town. Yes, Sundance Square is nice. It's like Bricktown. But you've got the opportunity to do some pretty breathtaking competition with a new well-designed center with adequate space. That's the other issue I would urge you to carefully consider. Don't think grand. Think in terms of phased opportunities. Start out with something more than some people might think and then be able to build upon that kind of footprint consistently over time as your business builds up. Orlando is a perfect example of a city that has done that magnificently well. They now have 1.3 million square feet of space going to 2 million square feet of space in six different phases of expansion over the last 20 years. And it's one of the most highly sought after destinations for obvious reasons as well. Um, but, but they didn't get ahead of themselves. They stayed within themselves, and that's really important. Thank you, Stephen. All right, Mike. Based on industry feedback, what are the top three challenges of the current convention center facility that makes it less competitive than other cities of a similar size? OK. Um, the first thing that I would say is that uh, several years ago, a, a very highly respected meeting planner, who's a good friend of mine by the name of Nancy Holder, uh, Nancy was the head of the meetings department at RJR Nabisco uh, and was named the International Meeting Professional of the Year back in like 87 or 88. Um, the comment she made was very simple. Why would I want to come to your city and insert any name when you give me challenges and I have the opportunity to go to a different city that gives me opportunities. That's what, that's what we're talking about today. Um, the challenges that we have, Sheila has talked a little bit about one of them, and that is, that's the space that we have in our exhibit hall. The inability of many of our clients to continue to grow their business. And let's not forget for one minute, this is a business. They want to make money. Their vendors want to make money. Carrie wants, wants people coming through the museum to continue to be able to keep the museum operating and, and doing the things they should be doing. Avis is a business person. Nona's is a great restaurant. She's not down there for her health. She's there to make money. Our hoteliers make money. The money that is generated in a convention center is generated in the community not inside the walls of the convention center itself. Unless we can allow business to come in and continue to grow that business, we're going to lose. We're going to lose that business and we're going to lose a lot of money. So that's number one, is the lack of space. Um, Sheila also alluded to the, uh, uh, the, the issue of, of the timing that it takes her group. And she's a great example. Stephen talked in his presentation about dates and space. Your show actually is how long? Three days. Two days. Two days. She occupies space in the convention center for two weeks because it takes so long to get the 
the machinery, the exhibits moved into the building, get them set up, get everything arranged, hooked up to be able to do two days of shows. After the show, all of that has to come down and be reloaded. Remember, their show is in August. How many of you all have come into downtown in the morning in August and really just gotten totally ticked before you ever got to your office because of all of those damn tractors and trailers sitting around the convention center <laughs> blocking Robinson, Reno, and Sheridan. She's the one. That'd be me. Yeah. They're there two days, and then those tractor trailers come back to take them all out. In a convention center that's properly designed, that has the load-in and load-out capabilities, we could load her in in two days. We could load her out in two days. That means that they're here for six days instead of 14. Being here for 14 days keeps us from renting that space to other customers. It keeps our hotels from having as much business as they would like to have. We love having them here, but they cost us money. They cost us business. You know, I don't want her to go anywhere else. I'm glad she's here, and we want to do things to continue to bring <coughs> OIGA here and continue uh, their success in Oklahoma City. But with the new convention center, we can be much more productive. So that's two reasons. You look at the other aspects of the building. Uh, we have a fairly low ceiling in this room. We have two screens, but those of you in the back, I suspect, are having a little <coughs> bit of problems seeing everything that's on the screen. Well, in our convention center, we have 14-foot ceilings in the <laughs> meeting space. Meetings, the meetings component, the education component, is becoming continually more important to meeting planners. Meetings demand education, and many of our industries, many of our associations provide continuing education programs for their membership. That means they have to sit in meeting rooms and see presentations and be a part of those presentations, whether they're attorneys, CPAs, uh, any number of professions. The higher ceiling you have, the easier it is to do the type of AV presentations that really can provide the meaning to you that you need. We've been hearing for years, and Stephen can, can talk about this, we've been hearing for years about the death of the meetings industry because of GoToMeeting.com or virtual meetings or satellite coverage of meet all those things. The reality is that being in the room with your fellow attendees and feeding off of the energy that each other provides is still the best way and probably will always be the best way, <coughs> best way to conduct these types of seminars. But to do that, you have to be able to do the right things, and that includes being able to do the type of AV presentations that are going to give benefit and, and return on the investment of the people who are spending their money to come to Oklahoma City for these meetings. So those are the kinds of things that we have to deal with in trying to attract groups to come here. And, and the last thing I would say is, uh, and, and I had not uh, thought about this until I've, I heard it from someone else a, a couple of years ago, Oklahoma City has never built a convention center. If you look at the Cox Center, it was not designed for what it is today. It was designed as an exhibit space with an arena, and there were a few little meeting rooms scattered around. But where the meeting space is located today with the ballroom is not the best way to design a convention center. I'm glad they did it. Uh, I'm glad it was done back in, in the 90s when MAPS 1 was passed and the expansion was done. We needed the space. But it is very difficult for planners to work in. It is not conducive to move people from the ballroom to the exhibit hall and back in a, in a timely fashion. It was done that way because it was the space that was available. I don't think we were going to close Sheridan any more than we we're going to close Sheridan today, you know, or close Reno to expand across streets like that. So, you know, it's, it's making sure we design a product that is designed right, is designed for not only what we need today, but for the future. And to Stephen's point, gives us the opportunity to expand over the life of that building, which is going to be at least a 50-year building. So Thank those you. are the things we need. Thank you, Mike. All right. So now we can, can dive a little deeper into, into these issues. Um, unfortunately, our microphones are probably downstairs still being loaded. 
Um, so you're just going to have to ask your question very loudly, and then I'll repeat it so that the folks in the back of the room can can hear it. So if anyone has a question, please just, just raise your hand, and, and we'll go from there. Yes. Is the current size proposed the best size for our city? The question is, is the current size, and I believe she means of the convention center, the right size for our city? Panel? Uh, well, it depends on what you mean by the current size. The, uh, the CS and L study that was done and the original concept of, that was presented was that we would have 200,000 square feet of exhibit space, 75 or 50,000 square feet of meeting space, and a 35,000 foot ballroom. Uh, obviously, when that was put together and the, as we were looking at everything, it's like that's what the market should have. Uh, one of the aspects that you always have to look at is money. Uh, what's the budget? Uh, what can we afford? And uh, based on the, the uh, MAPS budget that was put together, and now as we look at the cost of construction today versus when CSNL came out, we're talking about a building that will have about 100, and these are, are ballpark numbers right now, about 160 to 165,000 square feet of exhibit space. 60% more than what we have now, and it, that would be an advantage. Um, meeting space of about 40 to 45,000 square feet, and a ballroom of 30 to 35,000 square feet. So it would be, it would be somewhat smaller. Um, the question is, you know, is that what we will wind up with? Because as we move into the final design and the construction, what will the construction costs be then? Uh, are there opportunities to design it? Uh, obviously, we're going to design it so it can be expanded over a period of time. But as we get into the construction, is there, are there ways that we can do more on the front end instead of having to postpone things until, until later on? We've got excellent folks involved from uh, architects, uh, from the city, a number of different places. We'll be looking at those things, trying to get as close to that 200,000, 50,000, 35,000 number as we can within the budget that's available. Uh, all of those things you know, are, are yet to be seen. We know that with the, with the, the competition that we've already identified, <coughs> uh, the new building will move us up a step or two, uh, uh, as opposed to the people that we are competing with on a regular basis. We'd like to move up further than that. Uh, and if we can, great, you know, we'll do it. We still need the new building, no matter what. Uh, all the amenities that will be in it, the other things, it's important to build a building. But what we want to do is make sure that we can move as far up the ladder as possible uh, once we get into the construction and, and see what really happens with construction costs and the availability of dollars through the MAPS program. Thank you, Mike. That was a great question. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. That's a, a, a great question. I think many of you will, many of, of the folks in the room will relate to this. Her question is, how will the new convention center impact parking and have uh, allowances been, been made for that? Mike? Uh, there's a parking study being done right now. There are several different things involved in parking, including uh, the, par the parking that will be required for the new headquarters hotel that's being discussed. Uh, it is very common to see in these kind of situations with a headquarters hotel and a convention center that the parking is more associated with the hotel uh, and obviously allows for overflow parking for use by the convention center. Uh, there are several programs being looked at right now for additional parking around the city. Uh, and I think uh, the, the new city garage that's being built down next to City Hall, uh, part of the idea of that is it will provide some relief up closer to the Cox Center and uh, the existing hotels. So you'll see some other things happening. We, we talk about parking often, uh, and sometimes in a good way, uh, but we talk about that often, and, and I can tell you the city uh, is, is very well aware of it, and they're looking at it as well as uh, our subcommittee on the convention center and other folks that are, are looking to try to help solve those issues. Thank you. Yes, sir, back there.
the the question is what is the relevance of the of the exterior is that to to the convention and uh, to the convention business well, let, let me take a crack at that <laughs> What you want to do, ideally, is create a structure that looks like it belongs in the place that it is. And this morning, when I went on my run, I went around the city specifically to just kind of take in the landscape. And I was very impressed that all of the different desperate, disparate pieces seemed to, to fit together in, in a nice design, the park and you know, all of that. What you don't want to do is build some sort of edifice um, that is uh, a work of art. Uh, and you see this commonly in Asia. Uh, there are, for example, there are 165 cities in China with more than a million population. That's, in the United States, at number 16. Okay. Every one of those 165 cities has a beautiful, state-of-the-art looking convention center. And about 14 of them are occupied. It's a matter of personal pride on the part of each of those mayors to have the nicest looking structure. That's, that's wasting money. You want something that people here will be proud of. You want something that will be distinctive. Maybe in the United States, the best example of that is San Diego. San Diego Convention Center is right on San Diego Bay. At, at one corner of the facility are what they call the sales pavilion, as in S-A-I-L-S, four structures. Similar, if you've seen the Denver airport, similar to the structure there that replicates the mountains. It's, you see that picture and you know immediately, that's San Diego. You can do something like that without spending excessive money. It's a design issue. Simple as that. I'd like Avis, to go ahead. add just to that a bit. Um, I think that a convention center would need to uh, certainly uh, represent the amenities of our city. Hmm. I think when people come to that center, it speaks of, of who we are. But I also think, I agree, Stephen, you, you spend that money wisely. I think it needs an openness because uh, I was in a very interesting meeting in the past few days that we were discussing the fact that, yes, it's a convention center, but uh, an openness allows for all of us to feel um, comfortable walking in, hopefully maybe participating activities ongoing in that convention center other than just meetings. And if you have a friendly, open building that in, is inviting, it not only affects our visitors and, and their desire to uh, come to Oklahoma City, I think it also will affect all of us. And, and maybe we can make better use of that building if everyone feels comfortable. There's, there, there's one issue that you might want to start kind of thinking about, and that has to do with the ecology and the environment. And it is now possible to build a new convention center that, it, that is not only self-sufficient in its own power use, using solar, et cetera, but can generate excess capacity for the use of the city. If you're able to do that, you're going to get five-star reviews around the world. And there are very few existing facilities that can say that. So a LEEDS certified building that generates excess power would be a spectacular success. All right. Well, I, we don't have any more time for questions, but I think you all can agree that we have truly avoided the Austin problem. There are no hippies or fools on this, on this panel. So thank you very much for your, <laughs> for your participation, and thank you. Very much. Once again, I'd like to thank our signature sponsor, Cox Business, and I hope that you'll join us on Wednesday, August the 20th, for the Chamber's annual State of the Schools Luncheon, 
where Oklahoma City Public School Superintendent Rob New and Mike Petrilli will discuss critical education issues and grassroots efforts to make a difference in our school systems. And as always, you can register online at, at okcchamber.com backslash SOS. Thank you again, and this meeting is adjourned. No,